Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back for another Boca podcast episode, brand new guest, and uh, delving into a very popular topic, but we're going to take a different approach to it with my relatively new friend, Robert Hill. Robert and I have had the opportunity to chat a little bit ahead of this interview, but thank you for making time for us today, Robert. Yeah, man, I'm in, I am wicked excited to be here today. Well, and it, it truly, it, it, it is a privilege for me and for our listeners. You bring experience to the table, not only as a photographer, but you've had the opportunity to be able to help educate other photographers. And we're going to do some of that today again, hopefully. And we'll just yep. kind of jump right into to the questions. I know that I sent to kind of break the fourth wall here. And I've mentioned this before in the podcast, but I send an outline of questions ahead of time to our guests. So they can kind of look over them and get an idea of what we're going to talk about. But this first section is one that I stay pretty consistent on. The first question being about brand position. Robert, you're based in Portland. Is that right? I am. Portland, Oregon. Yeah. So in, in Portland, Oregon, Pacific Northwest, wedding photographer. I mean, you've got a, there are, you've got a lot of competition or so-called competition. There are other photographers doing the same thing. How do you set yourself and your brand apart from the other photographers? What is your brand position? Yeah, man. I think brand position is always a really interesting thing. I think deep topic uh, that you can take a lot of approaches on. I have found that, um, and, and really I have two kind of two different businesses. I have one that's very much education and business coaching, mentoring, that sort of thing. And then of course, wedding photography. So from a wedding photography standpoint, I guess in simple, I'm the reason, like I'm the, I'm the thing that sets myself apart, of course. And I think sure. that that's something that I coach a lot of people on is like how you become more aware of yourself and how you realize what's different about you than everybody else. But deeper than that, I deeply believe that my camera is not this thing that I'm using to take pictures as much as it's a tool that I use to help couples deepen their relationship. Yeah, which is, we're, we're going to get into this today because that is fascinating <laughs> to me. And I, I mean, I'm smiling, thinking about this, looking at this, it's right in front of me, actually. And for those of you listening, um, if you just go to robertjhill.com, you can also follow Robert on Instagram at the same thing, Robert J. Hill no spaces or, or punctuation or otherwise. Uh, and of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But on the homepage of your website, you say, my camera is my tool to help couples deepen their lives and empower their relationship so that they can have a stronger and more intentional marriage. That is a, that, that is a brand position and mission statement kind of melded into one and a really powerful one, very succinctly communicated. And, uh, and and I would say that you immediately differentiate yourself because photographers talk about their their art and their craft and the and the food that they like to eat pretty regularly, right? That's that's the the kind of yeah. common thing to do <laughs> these days. And instead of talking about photography, instead of talking about yourself, you're talking about how you're going to add value to this client or these clients. And not only that, it goes beyond the photographic value, the artistic value you can bring, but it is something that goes much, much deeper. You're going to empower their relationship. And I, this is, I mean, it's a bold statement. So we're going to explore that more a little bit later on, because what we are actually going to talk about today is kind of our primary topic is the reason behind what we do. And this is a really powerful reason. And uh, I really appreciate the inspiration, but we're going to get into the details of that in just a bit. Let me keep going, though. Talk to me about your experience as a wedding photographer. And first of all, give us a little bit of context. How many years have you been in business? Well, I picked up a camera for the first time when I was 12. Okay. Um, and I started my first business when I was 16. Wow. And so I have technically been uh, operating business a little bit on and off for 14 years. Cool. And, um, I took a little bit of a hiatus, little break. My first business was just like, I had no clue what I was doing and I was doing everything. And so after several, uh, years, about three or four years, I, I 
just put the camera on the shelf and took a full-time job doing production and media and that sort of thing for three years. And then I picked my camera back up and, and kind of ran with it again. So very much dedicated, focused for the last uh, seven to eight years. Interesting. And I bet that that shift for a short amount of time gave you a different perspective coming back into the business. Yeah, it did. And honestly, and I'm, I'm so glad that we're doing this today because there's there's so much that I've gone through, especially in the last few years, that has helped me kind of own my story even more. But I was doing production and post-production and web design and graphic design, everything media related for a church. And those three years that I had stepped out were um, incredible, incredible for me, not just due to like self-development stuff that I was doing, but bigger than that. Looking back, I realized that those were the years that because I was focused and I wasn't doing something necessarily that was like, oh, I got to make money and build a business. I was really focusing on how to grow another person's organization. It allowed me to really hone in what my style was, which I think was so key. Coming back, I think I, I it took me a while to really get to that point of, of realizing that, but those three years were were crucial for me to really define what it is that I liked in terms of how I use my camera style wise, like shooting and coloring and that sort of thing. Interesting. And I wouldn't have expected that that was the thing that you realized as a result of being involved in ministry. What, what led to that realization? When I first went uh, to work at this church, it was a really small organization. There was only a handful of staff members and I was one of them. And I, I was given a lot of responsibility and a lot. I was put into a leadership position and I was really young. Yeah. And so I think because I was put into a leadership position and given the space to, to lead really like I, it, it allowed me to kind of go, well, like no one's telling me exactly what to do. So I've got to figure it out on my own. Ah. And, and I think that that's what led me to going like, you know, I don't have the weight and pressure of I'm, I'm delivering a client and I'm trying to make money as much as I'm really putting intention towards my craft for something that was bigger than myself. And so I think working towards something that was bigger than myself, which yeah. is a really deep thing that I'm sure is going to like bleed into the rest of our conversation. But I think that that is what allowed me to really hone in on that style was and because I was so focused on one specific thing in how to how to create this one specific brand centric look that affected a lot of things. And it was honestly, it was a really beautiful time because I I was given responsibility, not just in the photography side of things, but in the video and in the design and all of that. And so, you know, everything from how I shot and composition and coloring to fonts that I used and how it is that I composed designs and laid things out and whatnot, all of that had a massive effect coming into my own business now where all of that translated. And so my own brand, like I, I kind of got to cultivate and build my own brand during those three years without even really noticing it. That's really cool. Well, and, and I mean, th yes, we're going to go deep. We're going to talk about what is underlying this idea of figuring out how to serve others beyond photography. But your your work is truly beautiful. And, and again, I'll refer our listeners to your Instagram account, just Robert J. Hill. If, if you have an opportunity, those of you listening in, to just scroll through, uh, the work is varying. It's wide ranging. The use of light is interesting. Composition is beautiful. Um, the, the tones are quite interesting as well that you're using. It, it's really beautiful stuff. So props to you. And, and for those of you listening in, make sure you follow along for some inspiration there. But I, I wanted to give context to my question, which has to do with one of the biggest lessons that you've learned as a business owner, or maybe the piece of advice that you'd be most apt to give to a fellow photographer if you had 15 seconds to do so from this ultimately 14 years of experience, what would that thing be? Oh, Really big thing to say, huge thing to unpack, but the biggest thing I would say is focus more on who you are than what you do. Hmm. Yeah, that, that is one that we will unpack, and, and I'm going to leave that sitting for a second. Talk to me about free time. I mean, as a business owner, there's so much to keep up with. 2019 culture, it's a very noisy world on multiple levels. How do you make time for your self-development that you're, that you're alluding to, as well as relationships with the important people in your life, uh, including your wife, Emily. How do you create time and space for those things outside of work? I'm definitely not uh, perfect <laughs> at that, but something, and it's funny, like just being in the season that I'm in right now, I'm in a, I'm in an intense season of uh, deepening my discipline and creating um, more strict boundaries on my life. And 
I really believe and I teach in this this philosophy of working less and making more. And I think that it's a very easy thing to say that if people are like, oh, what what does that really mean? And I I'm learning more and more every day of how when we create more boundaries on our lives, we can accomplish what we really need to accomplish. And I think for a long time, especially at the beginning of my business, I was doing so much stuff that I didn't have to do and putting out so much effort that I didn't have to put out. And so I guess in a very simple answer, like balance is a really big thing. And it's something that my wife definitely keeps me extremely accountable to. (laughs) You actually allude to this on your website too, right? You mentioned that you were going through a busy season before and that that kind of took a toll on your relationship. And I guess there was some realization that came out of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it literally broke me. I, I ran with the mentality of hustling for the first several years of my business and things went really, really quickly. And then I got to the point where that hustle was impossible to stop and my, my entire life kind of fell apart in 2016 in so many ways. And I literally did not, I could not grab it. I couldn't pick it up as it was falling. Like I had to let it fall. And once everything fell and I was left with what felt like nothing, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, hardest thing that ever happened to me, but the greatest thing because it forced me to step back and, and create more boundaries. And so really to, to, to answer your question really clearly, I am extremely strict with my schedule. Okay. I currently operate off of an eight to five schedule, uh, Monday through Friday. And if I need to shoot a wedding on a Saturday, then I'm picking up a different day that I can take off. But that's something that I have put in place in the last uh, year or two just because I've realized like there's actually, there's a a really great book called the 80, uh, like 80, 20. And it's all about the 80, 20 rule about um, 80% of your profits come from 20% of your clients. And like, just that's an easy way of saying it, but it's, it even alludes to 20% of what you really do on a weekly basis is, is creating 80% of what's coming back. So in realizing that I'm like, okay, if we really just get strict about our boundaries and like, we're willing to stick to that, you have to sacrifice some things, of course, but the things that I have to sacrifice, I know are not actually playing in and and actually helping me get to the life that I truly want. And so putting those boundaries on my life and making sure like I also got a co-working space in the last year, which has changed my entire life because now I get to go to work and, and leave work at work, which has been great. So yeah, man, Making time has been more of of uh, limiting the, t- the time that I actually focus on work. Well, and there's something to be said for committing to those boundaries. I mean, it, your your wife obviously brings a certain level of accountability if she knows, hey, and you say to her, hey, look, I'm I'm working eight to five Monday through Friday, and I take a day off if I'm shooting on Saturday. You've you've kind of committed to her that this is what you're going to do. So there's now accountability that goes beyond just your own self discipline. And I think there is, I don't know, it, it still amazes me the lack of commitment that photographers that I've seen photographers are willing to make even with something as simple as scheduling a coffee or going to, you know, a lunch or a brunch with fellow photographers, for whatever reason, the commitment to putting something in the calendar and actually following through on it is, uh, is a difficult thing, it seems for a lot of people. And so just simply making the move in the direction of, of actually committing to what you put in your calendar and following through on it can make a big, big difference, including a schedule of sorts through the week. And I think that's really great. I do have a question for you, though. You, you said something that caught my attention, which was you'd gotten in the season of hustle and found that you had a hard time coming down off of it or coming kind of taking a step back from that. Was there is, is there this momentum that you felt like if you stepped out of that momentum that it would somehow mess up your business? What was that like? Well, I definitely, I mean, momentum, I think for any business, like we're all playing into the art of creating momentum, right? And that's like fueling a lot of what we do. And for me, I had built so much momentum. And with that, having a lack of clarity around what I was really trying to do. And, and for me, what really hit the wall that I hit was being in that hustle mode. I, when I first jumped into my business, man, I thought, I thought, oh, in 10 years, I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. And two and a half, three years in, I accomplished it. And at that point, I hadn't looked farther. And so I, I remember, I literally remember the moment that I was sitting in this coffee shop in Germany and literally realizing, oh my gosh, you're doing everything that you dreamt of doing as a child. And, and then realizing, Two, two big questions hit me. One, what now? And two, your entire life is falling apart around you, but you're living what you thought were your dreams. Why are you really doing this if you're not 
actually happy on the personal front of things. And those mm. two questions crumbled me. And so I, I, uh, I like to refer to it as my tower falling because <laughs> yeah. I, I had built all of this momentum and I built such a, what I thought to be strong brand that had a lot of focus. And, and then I went through about a year of, uh, because I couldn't pick up the pieces. I literally had to watch my entire tower fall to nothing so that I could basically almost reset and restart with a much stronger foundation. Yep. Which I mean, it, we, we continue to set up these beautiful segues for what we're going to, what we're going to delve into here in just a little bit. So again, I'll leave that kind of hanging and we'll, we'll come back to it. Talk to me about an impactful business or self-help book, maybe even a podcast that you've read or listened to in the last few years that you would highly recommend to our listeners. Yeah. The one book I always recommend, first and foremost, is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. And I think it's a book that gets spread around, of course, in the business world a lot. But I think, uh, and I actually just got out of a session with, with um, one of my students talking about this, but really business is you know, slowly mastering the art of influence because influence is how we essentially win people over to what it is that we're doing. And so how to win friends and influence people is key. And it's, it's a lot of, it's a book that I, I literally read it every single year because it is such foundational principles to just us as human beings and how we interact with people yep. that, uh, you know, it's easy to read and be like, Oh, I knew this, you know? However, the, the bigger question that I'm, I'm drawing, into people is yeah you know this but how intentional are you being with these tools yep, and, exactly and so for me like since the first year i read it and I, i've read all the different versions of it now because they have like a digital age and, and the original and all these things but for me it's just a reminder of are you are you still being intentional with these just really foundational things that impact people so on such a huge level so i mean that's one and then another one that i always push towards people just because it's so so key and i think it it honestly, it was one of the greatest tools that I had that helped me fight out of an immense amount of um, depression and darkness that I fell in once I hit that wall is The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Oh, really? And, okay. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a book about self-awareness. And it's something that when you really step back and you look at the world, we aren't taught self-awareness growing up. Uh, if anything, we're taught the opposite of self-awareness. And it's one of those things that I don't, no one... Well, I mean, now it's becoming a thing, of course, like it's starting to shift into the Western world a lot more, but yeah, we aren't taught how to be self-aware individuals. And I think it's, it has, and I say this from my perspective and my story, like it was the, the key to me being able to work through and, and start to overcome the anxiety that I felt in life and the regret and guilt and shame that I felt in life. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy deep book, man. Like it's not one that you can just be like, Oh, I'm going to knock this out in a week. It took me a, re a year to read it and it's not a long book. And so wow. it's just packed with so much content that literally expands your brain with every page. And so, yeah, those are kind of two foundational ones that I'm usually sharing with people. Oh, that's good. We're, we're going to link to both of these in the show notes. A couple of points that came up there too. One, the, the the importance of doing versus simply knowing. I mean, it's so easy in these days to whether it's you know listening to an audiobook or listening to a podcast, even this one, and you know episode after episode and book after book, and it's fun to say that you've read a hundred books in a year and all this stuff. But what are you actually doing with it? And it's it's amazing how living a great life seems to come down to a few basic principles. And, it, and in that sense, it's not overly complicated. We have a tendency of kind of complicating things ourselves, but doing versus simply knowing, it's really important to keep that in mind. The other thing you mentioned was self-awareness. And you're right that this idea of self-awareness has certainly become more popular and, and all the emphasis on popular or pop culture. I mean, one of the things that's been most popular is this idea of, of a personality test or an Enneagram and while those have maybe some value, I think they're a bit simplistic in nature. Uh, number one, because, well, I guess just generally, because it's easy to say, I am this thing and put yourself in that box and then, and then shut the door and, and move on versus understanding the psychology that drives those behavioral patterns. And then also taking responsibility through that for the reality, which is that we can make change to be the person that we actually want to be, not this person that we already are. And there's a pretty mm. significant difference there, but it takes it takes self awareness in order to get to the place where you you realize the psychology, you take responsibility for that psychology, 
and you make the necessary change. And I, I think that a lot of people are just uncomfortable with, with that idea that they're responsible for ultimately how they look at the world. And uh, I think life is way, not only more interesting, but ultimately more exciting when you realize that, hey, I can make personal change, which translates then to how I'm able to run my business and the relationships around me, but I can actually take responsibility for that and make that change. I'm not just simply this Enneagram, or I'm not just simply this personality type. I'm not simply an introvert or simply an extrovert. There's a lot more to it. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Dude, I love everything you just said so much. I, uh, I, I love all those personality tests. Like I'm an ENFP. I'm a really strong seven on the Enneagram, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm constantly looking at those and realizing how, as valuable as those can be, they can easily put you in a box as well. And, um, and if anything, I believe that uh, I've discovered for myself that breaking out of every single box has really been the thing that's helped me progress and grow as an individual over the last five to seven years. And so, yeah, I think they're effective, but I, I think that they are are still a bit simplistic rather than getting getting deeper into who you are and knowing that you do have the power to change that and that it does come down to self-awareness of of and what you just said like taking a hundred percent responsibility for every single thing that happens to you in your life there's a lot of people that they go through life believing that life is happening to them and when you start to shift into uh, different levels of consciousness and you start to realize that life can happen by you and through you and that uh, rather than you are this thing you truly are everything and um, and when you really get down whether you take the route of science or you take the route of spirituality or you take the route of whatever you start to see that we are really all made up of the same things and and that we have the power to change the the reality that we've created for ourselves yeah when we choose to engage uh, well, we have the ability, I should say, to choose to engage with the world the way that we want to. And this reminds me of a conversation I was just interviewing another photographer yesterday, uh, and we got into, um, we kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit trail. We were talking about Instagram and, you know, all this conversation right now around Instagram and how the, the, the general culture is is essentially blaming Instagram for how they feel. And yeah. the, the question that, that I want to ask so many of these people is, what is it, what's behind the insecurities that you're feeling when you look at somebody else's work or the things that somebody else is doing and you feel less than, where, where is that insecurity coming from? Um, and addressing mm. that on a deeper psychological level, number one, instead of you know blaming Instagram and asking Instagram to make a change to their platform so that you can feel better, understand where totally. those insecurities are coming from, address those, number one, and look at, look at these, the difference between where you're at and where you see these other people are, whether it's in their photographic ability, their entrepreneurial career, their health journey, whatever it is. And you see the the span between yourself and those people. And instead of, again, feeling insecure and letting that shut you down, look at it as, as a point of inspiration that drives you to be better. And it's not about being the exact same person as everybody else, but you can take inspiration from that rather than letting it drag you down. And it's all in how you frame it. But it goes back totally. to this baseline mentality of I have responsibility for how I feel or think, feel, and then, of course, ultimately act. And that just makes such a massive shift in the way that we live life. So this, this is really interesting conversation. I know we could go way, way down that, that trail. But let me keep going here and, and ask you something related to photography. This has been kind of a fun question that we ask. But what's something in your camera bag um, that enables you to be a better photographer that might be a bit on the unusual side? It doesn't have to be a camera or lens. What comes to mind? You know, I don't, I honestly don't keep, like now I don't really keep anything all that unusual in my bag. I, I am, a, I have definitely simplified if anything. Um, so I don't think that I have a super interesting answer to this, but <laughs> one, one thing, one thing that I, that has definitely helped me and I, and I hate to even say this because I don't want to like product pitch, but I, I found hold fast gear like most people have years ago, right? And the yeah. straps are great, but, um, I use one of their little pouches. And so all that I carry all day is just two cameras on my hold fast straps with one of the pouches that has an extra lens and that's all that I have all day. And so it's a perfect little pouch to like, Hey groom, I need everything out of your pockets. Let me hold on to it for you for the next two hours and it can just hold on in my pouch. But, but yeah, I think that that changed a lot for me because that shifted me having to carry a bag and worry about one more thing like everything is attached to me at all times and um it's like a cool fanny pack almost yeah it's a super cool fanny pack <laughs> <laughs> i say that and then also like i have this this pelican case that's like a little pelican case to hold my cards okay and um i'm i'm 
once I finish up a card, it goes in that case and the case is actually in my actual physical pocket yep. and it doesn't leave my pocket all day. So those two things are definitely key just in me being able to create these little systems that have kept me streamlined, simplified, not having to carry as much stuff, but also knowing that the most important thing, cards, images are, are never leaving my body. Yep. And so, um, yeah. So, and you mentioned on your the about page of your site that you're you kind of moved in the direction of a minimalist lifestyle. I, I love the fact that you don't have an answer to the question just for that very purpose, that you're getting rid of anything that's not absolutely necessary, trying to figure out how to function as efficiently as possible. I think that's wonderful. So let, let me get back to um, our, the, the primary conversation at hand. And I know I alluded to this Instagram bio earlier, you say very, very simply helping couples deepen their relationship. You know, we talk about the importance of a very succinct brand position here on the podcast. So much of the time, it's it's tough for photographers and myself included, for that matter, to really narrow down a set of words, a sentence, a phrase, a paragraph, or otherwise, to what is only absolutely necessary in order to communicate something significant. And you've done that, helping couples deepen their relationships. Uh, and this goes beyond the camera, your craft, the accolades, you know, your your favorite food or coffee, whatever it is, you're going way deeper than that. And so I, I want to start first with a question, which is what was, I mean, this is your motivation now. And I know you alluded earlier to the shift in your career, but when you first started in photography, what was your biggest motivation for being a photographer? I mean, when I first started, I mean, when I was a teenager and I picked up a camera and I decided, oh, I was going to do weddings my mentality was definitely, oh, well, weddings, my thought process at the time was weddings pay the most, right? And so that was my initial jumping in. However, I also I also believe that every single one of us in those decisions we make, whether it's something that you know we realize is, is super deep or not, like we're making that choice for a, a deeper reason. Um, yeah. And I think I've, I've naturally had to figure that out over time. So, and I think that that draw to wedding photography specifically was for this deeper reason that, that I went on this journey to figure out, but it started with money. But then in that, when I, I left the industry, I came back, I, the first book I actually picked up and I'd say the first book that I ever personally intentionally read and, and enjoyed reading. Cause I did not grow up like valuing education i hated school i was always do the bare minimum and just make just get by type of person was dale carnegie's book and when i realized uh as i started to practice the art of influence i started to realize that the relationships that i were cre- that i was creating with people was the thing that ended up influencing my work the most but also the thing that inspired me the most towards my craft and so relationships were were the biggest thing that kind of propelled me forward and and drew me forward. And so, uh, and and that was partly like, I was considering that when I went into my systems and when I went into my business model and when I went into my vision and all of that, um, I started to see a deeper side of why relationships matter so much. And I I say this thing often that relationships change everything. Again, one of those simple things to say, but the depth to it that I, that um, I love to unpack is, it's just, it's infinitely deep. So yeah, like relationships and, and watching those relationships cultivate over time uh, and seeing kind of the synchronicities of life come into play and starting to see how different relationships I had with people led to different led to other relationships I had with people and then to watch my business grow so fast due to the intention that I was putting, if anything, more into the relationship with somebody than I was into my craft. Yeah. That was that was kind of my my thing, and I, I think it took me a long time to really understand why that was, and it took a lot of the experiences and even the whole breaking and everything with me because, like I, it, from the beginning, I was always really intentional with clients, and from a from a me to my client standpoint, I believe I led with a lot of deeper purpose and intention and whatnot. But my breaking honestly came from my viewpoint on the industry. And me trying to be somebody in the industry, even though I was serving my clients with every bit of myself, maybe even too much of myself, from an industry standpoint, I was led by ego a lot. Mm. And and it was coming to the realization of that, that ended up crumbling everything and shifting my entire um, trajectory in life, I would even say. Yeah, there's there's just simply, and it would take a long time to maybe to break it down, uh, the, the reasons why, but there's just simply not the fulfillment um, in our in our ego being stroked temporarily that there is in investing at a deeper level in the lives of, and in the betterment of somebody else's life, and certainly the relationships 
in other people's lives. It, it's it's so so huge. I mean, I, I realized this as a result of some of the experiences that I had growing up. It's something that I tried to to build into the brands. Um, in fact, very much both the the companies that I'm helping run and build right now are about relationships in the end, whether it's photographers at it, we're saving photographers time for the sake of relationships. We're creating a new brand right now, which enables collaboration and encourages relationships through that. At the end of the day, that's, that's kind of all we have left. The rest of it's kind of a game and, and yeah. we're left with these relationships. And, and so what are we doing to invest in those relationships? And I love that you've shifted in that direction, but I'm curious though, when you talk about this idea of helping couples deep, deep in their relationship with your camera, what are some tangible ways that you do that? Because it sounds great, but there may be a disconnect for some of our listeners who are like the camera, relationships. How are you making their relationship better? Yeah, I would say it, it It first, I mean, I always lead with everybody, whether it's on the education front or on the on the photography side of things, I always lead with, if you want to work with me, like you really need to understand that this is, this is more than me showing up and shooting, that this is something that we're going to interact often and we're going to cultivate this connection I live a lot in the world of energy. And so like cultivating an energetic connection with people is a really big deal to me. Um, and I see the results play out for the better every time that I, every time that I um, have used that route and tangibles, I would say, you know, every single person wants to be seen and heard and every single person wants to be understood from a deep psychological level. And I, I heard this quote once that that shifted a lot for me, and it was seek to understand rather than be understood. Hmm. And that, at the time of my life when I heard that, it it of course shifted something internally because it started making me go, hold up, how often am I trying to be understood rather than understand others? And that's a lifelong journey, right, of, of doing that. I can get better at that every single day for sure. But I I stepping outside of my own head and starting to see reality i think for a little bit more of what it is a lot of people aren't seen and heard and i mm. when i look at um a lot of the problems that we have in our world it's really comes down to people not being truly seen and heard and people deciding that they'd rather own their opinion and be stubborn in their standpoint rather than trying to really understand somebody else and honestly man this is not this is not something that i just like came to me if anything like this is something that my wife has taught me so much like i grew up and th- and this is really weird to say like even now but i didn't real i didn't grow up learning how to build relationships and i grew up and i think a lot of people do the same like we we kind of uh, we we are taught to live on autopilot and just to react rather than respond and so my wife when we got married and even before that she always drove with this word intention and at the time i didn't even know what intention meant i'm like what the hell is intention and <laughs> it was it was honestly like her just driving it into me over and over and over where i started to see it and then i was like oh i get it and then when i started to live a life of a more intentional life and a more intentional business i started to see all of this stuff blossom and so tangibles on a very simple way, like when I show up and talking, and, and these are some of these points are like Dale Carnegie points, but like talking in terms of the other person, really getting to understand how people feel and what people are wanting um, more than just listening to them. Because a lot of people don't actually say what they want. They say they, they think they do, but they're really wanting something dip, deeper. So talking in terms of other people, when I get into conversations, I, I almost have made it a game for myself of um, can you look at somebody in in the eyes and not break glance? Those things that are little foundational things, but really help people feel seen and heard. Um, but bigger than that, it's, I realize, and I, I get this question a lot from photographers is like, what, what questions do you ask couples? And there is no right question. There is just the question that's right for them. And, and that's not something that you can go in analytically with a plan to ask. It's something that you really have to stop thinking while someone's talking hear them see them for what they're really trying to say and and then asking a little bit of a deeper question yeah and so from the initial phone call some of the things i'm doing is i'm asking some really big questions to bridge their relationship a little bit more i realize and, and a lot of this comes from my own story like i realized how unintentional as a man i was and when you really step back and you look at the difference between men and women and masculine energy versus feminine energy women are nurturing and they are they're very care they're, they're caregivers uh, where men are very logical and analytical and rather than going in analytical i've had to 
slowly learn a deeper side of empathy. And so when I go into a conversation, I'm trying to be wicked aware of where is this couple at in terms of their relationship and as human beings, in terms of self-development and asking questions that kind of bridge that gap. So sometimes it's asking a specific question to to the groom like one of the questions that i've i've often asked is just like hey why why her like out of every single individual that you could commit your life to be it for a season be it for the rest of your life however you see the world like why is she the answer or why is he right of course i'm working with all different types of of couples but why are why are they why are they your person and we don't ask why enough i think and Mm. when you really start to ask a deeper question like that seen men have to dig down and they're a lot of times they're on the spot even. And so they have to dig down and, and answer and pull out that emotional side that men don't usually open up to. And just in that right there, I watch going into a conversation in which my, my intention when I go into a conversation with a couple is not to book them. It's, can I go into this conversation and help them connect on a deeper level? And if by opening up a man to truly express his emotions and his feelings to his significant other that maybe he hasn't done in a long time, then I've done my job because the the female or just the partner walks away going, wow, like I... I haven't heard you say that, you know, mm. or that's that maybe that's not something I've ever heard you say. Maybe that's that's something I haven't heard you say in a while. Yeah. And and that that in and of itself deepens that relationship. I another tangible I do, and this is this is a really interesting one that that I've cultivated over a long period of time, but they talk about like the window the eyes or the windows of the soul and whatnot. And there's a lot of fascinating psychology around sitting down and looking at someone in the eyes for an extended period of time even going back Dale Carnegie, look at people in the eyes when you're talking to them. But I start every single one of my shoots. Of course, like I, I know the couple pretty well by the time I show up, but once it's actually time that I pull out the camera, the first thing I always start with is I have them stand and just hold hands looking at each other. And for five minutes, they just stare into each other's eyes. They Whoa. don't talk and they do not do anything, but just look at each other in the eyes. Okay. And so that right there that kind of gives me goosebumps and tears as i'm thinking about it. honestly like that's that's pretty hardcore yeah and i do this on wedding days as well at times especially if i see a couple like flustered and just like you can see that their day is flying by it's non-stop like i'll be shooting and then when i have about 10 minutes before we need to wrap up i will I, I find that it's far more valuable not for me to shoot for five or 10 more minutes, but to give them five or 10 minutes to look at each other in their eyes on their wedding day and finally stop mm. thinking and just be with one another. So it, it has a wild effect on my shoots um, in terms of connectivity and how it is that I interact with people. But yeah, man, those are, those are a couple of the things that I'm doing. Oof, wow. How did, it, how did some of these couples respond? Because I can't imagine that everybody feels comfortable enough in their own skin and with each other to, to just naturally be like, all right, I'm going to stare at my significant other for five minutes. Every single person I've ever worked with has, has taken it really well. Really? Um, and yeah, they have, it is, I would say there's been a couple people that like, you know, they start talking or something like that. Cause clearly it's uncomfortable, but it's not like I'm showing up and I don't know them. And then I'm just being like, Hey, do this. I actually, to be completely honest with you, I did this at a workshop recently and I'll, I'll, I'll never do it like this again because it was not, it, it was a big learning lesson for me. I started the workshop having people do this and they were complete strangers, Whoa. wicked, uncomfortable. Um, uh, and I think that was a, a big realization for me of just like what it is that I'm doing leading up to a shoot with a couple in terms of engaging with them and asking them these bigger questions and just being really intentional with my time with them yeah. to get them to the point where once we show up and I have them do this, like they are comfortable because they trust me on such a deep level that they know that whatever I'm asking them to do is not just because I'm having them do something, but because the intention I have behind it is again, and they see it from the first point they get on my website. Like I'm not here to shoot photos. I'm here to deepen you. And that is going to manifest the photos that you see me create on a regular basis. So so you're setting the stage, though, and that, that does make a big, big difference, I, I, I guess. 100%. If, like you're saying, if you're, if you're to go in blind, not know them, they don't know you, and then you ask them to do something like that, it probably would seem a little bit weird. But that's, that's really powerful. And, and I love, you know, you, you talked about how people want to be seen and heard. At the root level of that is a very simple principle of significance. Tony Robbins talks about how that is one of the, the kind of base human needs is to feel significant. And that looks 
different for different people. But the idea of being truly seen and heard and on a deeper level and being acknowledged, it ultimately brings a sense of significance. And we do all want to feel that. I mean, when my my daughter recently has just like flipped a switch, she's only 14, but she started asking me questions consistently, just engaging me. She'll come home from school and asking me, you know, how my work went or how an interview went or how this thing went or that went. And I'm just, I'm floored by it. And part of yeah. that is, of course, just my relationship with her and and knowing where she's at in life and, and trying to raise her as, as a halfway decent parent. But then the other piece of that is just somebody actually cares enough to ask about my day and has taken the time to do that. And so that in and of itself is a simple thing that we can do any and everywhere. I think it's fun to engage somebody at the checkout counter, you know, like Walmart or something, because they don't expect somebody to care enough to even engage them and use their name and ask how they're feeling and or ask about their day. And then, of course, there's opportunity to potentially even go deeper, start off with a deeper question, really throw them off guard. But but showing creating an atmosphere that lends a feeling of significance to somebody can make a massive difference. And it certainly will translate to our camera. So I love that that you bring that to light. And, and you talked about tangible steps. And, and I wanted to make this really tangible for our listeners. We, you, you talked about the kind of the tangible steps that you take with your clients, but I'd love for you to share tangible steps on a, on a kind of a bigger picture level that photographers listening in can take to add deeper meaning to the business that they're running. And we're talking about the significance of understanding why they're doing what they're doing. Tangible steps in terms of kind of deepening for what I have found. I've definitely found that one questioning, right? Asking why I think a lot of, we we are all brought up in the world in a very specific way that's unique to us. And we are taught, you know, what we are taught and based on the people that have been surrounded by us. And so we really learn about the world from all of these different people that have had influence on our lives and we aren't taught to question those things we we make sense of reality in the way that we make sense of reality but for me it was starting to ask why and i think this started with you know the first time i ever watched simon sinek's ted talk on on asking why yeah it's uh it is the if anything the the shifting point in what i do with people is helping them discover why they do what they do discovering their purpose and so asking why, why is it that I am who I am? Why is it that I do what I do? And, and, and that question is interesting because, and I, I'm so fascinated by it because it is literally the, the smallest yet most expansive question in all of existence. It's three letters, yet it's an infinite answer. And I see a lot of people, and this is, it takes a lot of time because you're, you're processing, right? You're expanding your mind and expanding your mind's uncomfortable because you're going into areas of your mind that you've and into your subconscious that you've never possibly explored. And so right. it is wicked uncomfortable. However, the more that you ask why, the more aware you become. And if anything, I've realized that the world inside of me is far more interesting than the world outside of me. And so I'm just dedicated and have just I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to just expand that world more and more. Um, so asking why is huge. Two, I would say, I think, again, looking internally rather than externally, we, we so often look external for education. And there's a lot to be said about that and, and some beliefs I had around that. But I think self-educating yourself above everything is key. And so reading is, is, is something that I firmly believe is so important because you're dedicating thought and attention and focus towards a specific topic that you're going to expand on. The topic that I, I always really push people to focus on is the topic of influence. If you really want people to want what you have, it comes down to influence. And I think on a really deep level here, man, like I, I see, granted, I am, if anything, I'm transitioning from being an extremely black and white person to being a far more colorful person. And <laughs> I feel your pain, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've definitely worked through a lot of these thoughts over the years, but I see that there's really two types of two types of people in business. And, and that is the people that drive with an immense amount of intention and purpose. And again, this is a spectrum. So I'm not saying like we're sticking to the extreme polar opposites of these, but you have the people that drive with intention and purpose. And then on the other side, you have the hustlers. And I, I grew up assuming a lot and it came there came this point in time where I had to really admit with myself that I assume a lot about life. And sometimes I say shit that I don't really know. And 
now I've created a trigger in myself to really look things up and really try and understand what things are. And mm. I think that the term hustle is something that a, a while back it triggered a lot of not so pleasant emotions within me. Um, however, I think there's a place in time for hustle. But when I went to really look at the definition of hustle, I was so fascinated by the actual tangible definition that Google will give. And that is, uh, there's a couple things, but essentially it says to move unceremoniously, to force, to sell aggressively. Interesting. And nobody wants that. And nobody truly finds happiness living an unceremonious life. And again, my thoughts, my story. But yeah, so I, if anything, I fight against hustle. I think hustle is partly why our world is the way that it is. Yesterday, my wife called me and she, this isn't being talked about right now, but the, the uh, Amazon rainforest is on fire, like a massive fire in one of the largest rainforests in the world. And it's due to hustlers. It's due to people looking to get rich and not looking out for the, for the greater side of humanity. And so I, I see that hustle being on the side of force and um, intention and purpose being on the side of influence. Everybody deep down, whether we can come to the point where we admit it or not, we all want to be loved. And maybe it's super idealistic. Maybe it's super woo woo. I don't, I don't care, but like I have just found that siding on the side of love is so much better than siding on the side of fear. And so studying the art of influence. Uh, secondly, or, or next, I would say tangibles. We have an overabundance of education in the world right now. And I think more now than ever before, we, we look at even art, let's just stick to our industry, workshops and conferences. There are so many to go to that you have no idea which one is really going to be beneficial. And conferences and workshops, I see these things that you get a bunch of speakers that speak for an hour and your life is not going to be changed off of a one hour conversation or a one hour lecture or keynote. And I have found, and the people that I work with, and I don't say this because I do this, I just say this in general, I found that working one-on-one long-term with people has a far greater and far faster impact on people in terms of getting where you want to get. And so the next tangible thing I would say in deepening what it is that you do is find a mentor or a business coach that's willing to build a relationship and really truly get to know you rather than somebody who's just going to dish out information in a keynote and then walk away. And then lastly, for me is kind of personal growth and self-development outside of business. And so I practice yoga and meditation regularly. And it's, it's funny because like my wife's been doing yoga for a long time. And when she first kind of started inviting me, I was, of course, the skeptic. And I'm like, what is this weird thing that I'm seeing people do. But the moment that I started to do yoga and practice yoga, I started to understand myself better because it is a, it is a, it's not a competition. It's not a, who can be the best, the strongest, the most fit. It's literally a personal journey. So I, I often go to, you know, classes, retreats, courses, workshops around this. One of the thing I've, I've been heavily influenced by in the last several years is meditation. Partly even that book I I spoke to earlier, Eckhart Tolle, his his main point in that book is essentially that suffering only exists due to us living in the future or living in the past. And most of our time is spent living in the future and in the past rather than in the now. And meditation is not about clearing your thoughts or about doing any of that stuff. It's just about literally being in the present moment and realize how little we actually do that. And so I actually recently went to uh, back in April, I went to a 10 day silent meditation course um, wow. uh, in Italy. And so I disconnected from the world for 10, 10 days. And I was practicing a, practicing a specific technique called Vipassana, which is an ancient meditation practice that I literally told my wife last night, I'm looking at doing another one uh, by the end of the year, because it was the most transformative thing I've ever done in my life, because it forced me to stop. And it forced me to learn how to take care of myself on such a deeper level. And it's funny, man, I've talked to so many people about this just in personal one off conversations and how many people I've heard say, oh, I could never do that. And I think going back to what we were speaking to earlier about creating your reality, the words I can't are the most poisonous words, I think, in life. And you truly can do anything. It's just about are you willing to step in and try, you know? And so 
that was one of those things. I had no idea what it was about. I was just like, yeah, I just feel like disconnecting for 10 days and getting silent would benefit me from my constantly moving brain. And so stepping into that situation was incredibly uncomfortable, not because I was silent or not because I couldn't talk, I should say, but as much as when you start to actually shut up, (laughs) everything comes up and you're, you're forced to deal with it. And the difficult part is dealing with it without being able to talk, without being able to process externally how most of us do process. And so that was an incredibly transformative thing that I'm, I practice very regularly, um, almost daily now, uh, and it's something that I'm looking to deepen going forward. So I would say focusing on more personal self-growth development outside of the business world and outside of work and photography and that sort of thing. Maybe what most people need to lose the anxiety that they have around Instagram is not going to another workshop, but maybe it's going and going into silence for 10 days and really sitting there. And and like you said earlier, what is causing these emotions? Because it's not Instagram choosing to make a platform the way they are. It's really something deeper within you that you haven't dealt with. And so, yeah, I mean, you say, you say 10 days, but I I mean, start with 10 minutes, you know, I mean, this is totally because the impact it's a, my experience with meditation overall has been quite incredible as well. And, and I'm going to be making a concerted effort to do it more and more consistently uh, than I have in the past because there's significant benefit on multiple levels. One of those benefits though, that I've found is it just, it even gives my, my mind an opportunity, especially if it's maybe middle of the day or even late morning, an opportunity to process in a way that I didn't really have the opportunity to because I was doing what you were talking about, Robert, just going, 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 just sitting yeah. for a second. You'll notice that these these thoughts flood in and you know the, the kind of stereotypical, the cliche uh, assumption about meditation is this idea that we're not supposed to think about anything. But I read a book some years ago that I, I want to send a copy to you too, Robert, if you haven't read this yet. It's called The Untethered Soul. But he, he oh, talks, yeah. Michael Singer talks in this book about um, how this idea of meditation being very simply, on, on, at least on one level, seeing a thought. So these thoughts are going to come in. You don't have to try to control that or minimize that. You see the thought in and then literally see it out, almost like you're seeing it out the door. And you repeat this process over and over again where there's a bit of acknowledgement and then there's a letting go. You repeat that process over and over and over again to the point where, I mean, seriously, after you know, 10, 15 minutes, I'm, I'm in a, a whole other world almost uh, because I've, I've repeated this process over and over and over again. What it enables me to do is to be able to sit and truly be present with my thoughts, but not let them run me or control me or take over. I acknowledge them, but I see them out. And it brings a sense of calm to my mind, which is which is incredible, and it enables my my mind to relax a little bit, but also be able to have a better grasp on what's going on, ultimately. And it's a really powerful experience. But you got to make the time. So starting with ten minutes, and, and then maybe moving to fifteen, and then to twenty, and then maybe going to a, you know a day or two meditation retreat and beyond. Uh, but actually making the time for that is where we've got to start, and it's really important. But let me just review very briefly those principles that you shared. Number one, starting questioning or start questioning why. Uh, and, and I love the emphasis and the theme in this in our conversation today, Robert, around this idea of understanding the deeper why behind what we feel, what we think, what we feel, and then what we do. I think that's so important. We could spend multiple podcast episodes just on that point, but start with why. Studying um, and making the effort to self-educate, so reading, listening, uh, particularly number three around the art of influence. And if you haven't read How to Win Friends and Influence People, those of you listening in, we'll link to it in the show notes, get a copy, get the audiobook, listen, read, really powerful. And it's fascinating to me still how this book was written something like 100 years ago, and it's still just as applicable now. Really, really powerful stuff. Find a one-on-one mentor. There are certainly benefits, uh, Robert. I think maybe off air you alluded to the significance of community uh, with these mm-hmm. workshops and conferences. There's significant benefit. I, I think about um, Show It United as a conference that I go to each year, and that has been the biggest benefit to me is the community, the sense of community that I get from that conference. I mean, the connection is wonderful. But there yeah. is something to be said for that one-on-one mentorship and the value there. 
Uh, and then number five, what doing something outside of your business for the sake of personal growth. And this is huge. And th- this could be, again, on multiple levels. It's not just about meditation, but going outside of your business for the sake of personal growth is really important. This is great. This is practical, actionable stuff, which I'm a huge fan of, Robert. And I really appreciate you making time to share with us today. We just remind our listeners where they can find out more about your brand and also about the education piece of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, robertjhill.com is my website. Education.robertjhill.com is my education site. There's actually um, a bunch of resources, blogs, things like that. I actually wrote a book a few years ago called Poser that kind of even goes a little bit deeper in terms of relationships and how it, I actually give away my entire posing process in that book. But wow. they can grab that off okay. of that. And as well, if anybody ever wants to jump in and, and dive deeper, and maybe it's not even to, to you know do coaching and mentoring and that sort of thing, but I, I open up 30-minute sessions for photographers just to jump in and kind of talk and me kind of help them see something that maybe they're not seeing in their business so that they can grow. So that's another thing if they want to get more one-on-one, and that's kind of a time slot that they can get in there and we'll talk through mentoring and stuff if that's something they want to do but instagram at robert j hill and that's it perfect and we'll link to all of these in the show notes Uh, again thank you for making time to share with me i mean this has been encouragement and inspiration for me but also with our listeners as well here at the book podcast awesome thank you so much for listening to the book podcast will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the apple podcast app And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com.